here with you this morning. The last time I preached, it was a almost empty crowd of five people, and I looked at the camera more than anything. So it's good to be with you in person. Welcome, though, to those who are watching, and uh, welcome to any of our visitors here today. We're glad to have you. I also want to thank my pastor, Simon, and our elders for entrusting the pulpit to me today. I know they do not take uh, this ministry lightly, so I thank you for um, trusting me. And I thank you for your prayers this week. I know that many of you have been praying for me, and um, I certainly experienced the blessing of those prayers in my preparation, so thank you. Please turn with me in your Bibles, if you have one, to John chapter 6. And if you don't have a Bible here today, there are some in the pews in front of you. John chapter 6. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 15 today. John chapter 6, 1 through 15. One of the challenges in preaching through a passage like this one today is that it's so familiar to us. This may be the most well-known of all of Jesus' miracles, and even those who were not raised in the church likely have some familiarity with it. And we might be coming to this story today with memories of a Sunday school class or of a children's Bible which emphasized all manner of different things, some of them right and perhaps some not so right. My kids and I were talking about this just the other day, and one of them said, Dad, that story we have called Barley, Loaves, and Fishes, it's all about the little lad and really nothing about Jesus. And she's exactly right. Although I'm sure this little lad was a fine boy, he's not the center of attention in John's account here that we're going to read. So my prayer throughout my preparation and for us today is that the Holy Spirit would speak to us. And that he would apply the text and reveal to us the proper emphasis and application. I have titled today's sermon, Jesus, Our Provider and Portion. Let's pray before we read. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning a needy people, needing your Holy Spirit to apply your words to our heart. Father, help the speaker and the hearer alike, so that as a result of being in this place today, we would go out and bring you more glory than we did coming in, and that we would be more satisfied in you. Father, help us now, we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Okay, let's read together. John chapter 6, starting in verse 1. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. A couple of months ago, I had the privilege of being 
in this pulpit. And I was preaching from the book of Luke on Jesus miraculously calming the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Well, here in the book of John, we are geographically and historically very close to the place where that miracle on the water happened. We are on the northeastern shores of the Sea of Galilee. And through John's eyewitness account, we are invited to observe another miraculous sign performed by Jesus. Aside from Jesus' resurrection, the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle recorded for us in all four Gospels. You can find it in Matthew 4, 13 to 21, Mark 6, 31 to 44, Luke 9, 12 to 17, and of course here in John. Verse 1 of John chapter 6. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Where had Jesus been prior to this event? If you review John 5, you will see that Jesus has been in Jerusalem where he has made himself some enemies. He healed a man on the Sabbath who had been paralyzed for 38 years, and he had some intense conversations with the religious leaders about his identity and his uh, divinity. And Jesus' message was not well received in Jerusalem. In John 5.18, we read that this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. In addition to the Jews' anger towards Jesus, Matthew's account in Matthew 13, 14 tells us that Jesus had just heard that John the Baptist had been executed. Jesus knew it was time to get out of Jerusalem, at least for now. And so over the period of a few months, he makes the 180 kilometer trek with his disciples to a desolate place in the northeast corner of the Sea of Galilee. In verse 2, we read, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Matthew's gospel gives us more insight to the signs that Jesus had been doing and of the extent to which his fame had spread. Listen to what Matthew records in Matthew 4, 23 to 25. He went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. What is clear is that the news of Jesus and his miraculous signs was spreading everywhere. And the size of the crowd during our miracle today gives evidence of that. Matthew's gospel tells us that there were 5,000 men there that day besides women and children. It's likely that the gathering there that day was larger than the entire population of Kenora. But let us notice the motivation for the crowd in following Jesus. John says in verse 2 they were following him because he was healing the sick. As I read this statement, I couldn't help but feel a little bit depressed. I wish John could have been able to record that they were following him because they recognized that he was the son of God and had the words of eternal life, as Peter would later confess in this chapter. But John doesn't say that. They were following him because they could reap some temporary benefit from him, such as healing. And if you think I'm being too quick or harsh in my judgment of this crowd, look ahead to verse 26 of chapter 6, and you will see that the crowds continued to follow Jesus, not because they wanted him as their all-satisfying Savior, but because they hoped to get more bread. I suggest to you that the same motivation for following Jesus is just as prevalent today as it was 2,000 years ago. 
In its most obvious and shameless form, we hear it from health, wealth, and prosperity preachers who tell their followers that if you have enough faith in Jesus, he will give you in this life health and riches and an easy road to heaven. There is nothing said of repentance, of a sanctified life which will inevitably follow genuine faith, or of the cost of discipleship or of the many trials by which we must enter the kingdom of heaven, all of which the Bible clearly teaches us. More subtly, we hear in the gospel presentation that only says, believe in Jesus and you will get heaven, as if Jesus is a means to an end other than himself. And perhaps even more subtly still, We see it in our own hearts when we grumble and complain about the loss of some minor earthly comfort. Things like having to wait in construction on the highway like I did a couple weeks ago. Or having to wear a mask at the grocery store. Or losing our Wi-Fi signal. Or wanting a sunny day when it's a cloudy day or wanting a cloudy day when it's a sunny day. And if you haven't noticed, the culture we live in is not doing us any favors, nor should we ever expect it to. The culture we live in worships comfort and leisure and is in the hot pursuit of God's gifts. When you drive into our own town, you receive the commands from the roadside to eat, shop, and explore, urging us to make God's gifts our priority. Summers in Kenora are spent, sadly, by many professing Christians in an anxious pursuit of as much sun and lake time as possible. And it comes at the expense of their relationship with Jesus and God's people. I think we've all likely experienced this draw and recognized its appeal to our flesh. And if we've ever bought into the lie that the world is selling us, we discover that the good gifts of God do not satisfy the soul. No amount of sun or fishing or food or you fill in the blank for yourself will give us the satisfaction that we long for or have been made for. God's gifts are good and they're meant to be enjoyed by us, but let us guard our hearts when we see the gifts of God rivaling our affection for God himself. In John 6, 35, the great discourse that Jesus' miracle of bread and fish is building towards, we read, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. When we come to Jesus For Jesus, we are satisfied because we have all that we need. This is the point that the writer of Hebrews is making when he writes, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Oh, may God give us the grace necessary to be able to say with the psalmist in Psalm 73, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Is Jesus your portion this morning? Back to our text in verse 3. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. This was not the first time that Jesus and his disciples had ascended one of the large hills around the Sea of Galilee. You may recall from Jesus' most sermon, most famous sermon in Matthew 5 uh, and 2-7, sev- the Sermon on the Mount, that Jesus went up on a mountain at that time as well and sat down with his disciples. His ascent of these mountains is reminiscent of Moses' ascent on Mount Sinai where he received the Ten Commandments, which he then delivered to the Israelites. 
Well, similarly here, we see Jesus, who himself is the word of God, according to John 1.1, ascending this mountain with his disciples where he would teach them about the kingdom of God with divine authority. We also see that Jesus clearly has a special interest in his disciples. After all, out of everyone, he had chosen these 12 to be his closest followers. He knew this crowd was there, waiting to see him. And Jesus knew their time would come to be with him. But first he chose to spend time alone with his disciples. The text doesn't tell us what Jesus said to his disciples, but it does tell us that he sat down with them, which was the customary position for a first century teacher to take while he was teaching. On to verse 4. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Many would have been making the pilgrimage from Jerusalem for Passover, and there was a route along the eastern shores of the Sea of Galilee, and it's likely that dozens of people would have been passing by the exact location where Jesus and his disciples were. Of course, this would have added to the size of the crowd, which at this time is believed to have been reaching upwards of 20,000 people. I found it interesting as I was studying that in chapter 5 of John, he opens with a reference to a feast of the Jews in Jerusalem. Here in the beginning of chapter 6, we have a reference to the Passover, the feast of the Jews. And in chapter 7 too, a reference to the feast of booths being at hand. All of these feasts were intended to remind the Jews of the great provision of God throughout all their history. And amid these feasts going on, we have Jesus, who is the ultimate fulfillment of God's provision, the bread which comes down from heaven, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he's about to host a feast of his own to bring attention to his ability to provide and his identity as the Son of God. Verse 5, lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Matthew and Mark's Gospels both tell us that when Jesus saw the large crowd, he felt compassion on them. This is truly remarkable. Yes, Jesus has and would once again declare and prove by his works and miracles that he is fully God, equal with the Father. But let us not forget that he was also fully human, born in the likeness of men, as Philippians 2.7 tells us. Jesus has just finished an incredibly long journey. He was certainly grieved over the loss of his friend, John the Baptist. And he was very likely looking forward to some rest with his disciples. But Jesus was all about fulfilling the works for which his father had sent him to accomplish. And in this, in this moment of exhaustion, he is full of compassion for this crowd. Luke's account tells us that Jesus began to speak to them about the kingdom of God and curing those who had need of healing. Again, according to the other gospel writers, the teaching carried late into the evening. And although we've seen from verse 2 that the crowd was largely motivated by the physical benefits that Jesus could provide, let us take note now of the crowd's willing desire to sit under his teaching. Hours had passed since they'd arrived. And the small amount of food that they may have brought with them was all but gone. They were hungry, and yet they listened. They were getting tired, and yet they listened. Some of the infants in the crowd would have likely been crying, and yet they stayed. The words of Jesus were a different kind of food that day. Food for their souls. Perhaps some of them were actually beginning to recognize that Jesus was the Son of God. And they understood more clearly what Moses went, meant when he wrote in Deuteronomy 8.3, Man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. How is your appetite 
for the word of God these days. Like this crowd, do you and I lose track of time as we sit under God's word, beholding his glorious attributes, meditating on his truth? Or does the slightest growl in our stomach, the sound of a phone notification, or the floor which really needs sweeping, draw us away from the presence of God into another busy day? Our desire for time spent with God can be so weak, can it not? For the Christian, the life without feeding on God's word daily is an unsustainable life. It would be like attempting to run a marathon without water. We know that our days will be filled with temptation and trials and difficult relationships, and to go into these days without first having sat alone with Jesus and his word is like going into battle without a weapon or without armor. Consider the discovery that George Mueller made on early on in his Christian pilgrimage. He says, and I quote, I saw more clearly than ever that the first great and primary business to which I ought to attend to every day was to have my soul happy in the Lord. The first thing to be concerned about was not how much I might serve the Lord or how much I might glorify the Lord, but how I might get my soul into a happy state and how my inner man may be nourished. I saw that the most important thing I had to do was to give myself to the reading of the Word of God and to meditation on it. And if you read the history of George Mueller, he certainly lived for the glory of God, but recognized the importance of being with God daily in his word. Might I encourage you, though, not to despair when you know that you should read your Bible, but you often desire something else more than time spent with God. In these times, simply go to him in honest prayer. Confess to him your lack of desire for him. Seek his forgiveness and ask him to change your desire and to help you to delight in his word. Ask him to satisfy you with himself. It is a good prayer, and I believe that God will help change our desires through such prayers. And now we come to the great moment of testing for the disciples in verse 5. Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. I wonder how long Philip pondered Jesus' question before answering Perhaps if he had have reflected on the past few months for a while, he would have given a different answer than the one he did. Perhaps he would have said, well, Jesus, I remember when you told the wind and the waves to stop and they obeyed you. I remember when you healed that man's son who was almost dead. I also remember that wedding where you turned the water into wine. You've done so many miracles, I can't even remember them all. Jesus, you made the mountain that we are sitting on and you are holding up the sun over there with your very power. Jesus, we don't need to buy bread. If you could just make some. Verse 7, Philip answered him. 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Philip, instead of reflecting on the nature and character of Jesus, which had been revealed to him for months, is doing math in his head. 200 denarii was equivalent to eight months' wages. They could not possibly come up with that kind of money in short order. Andrew takes stock of what's available among the crowd, but all he can come up with is a boy's five barley loaves and a couple of pickled fish. What are they for so many? 
Philip and Andrew, the chosen disciples of Jesus, who had a front row seat to his divine power in action, had sadly failed this test of faith. They were overwhelmed by their circumstances, and they could perceive no human solution. I wonder how we would have responded in this situation. I'd like to think I'd have responded differently, but I'm not so sure. Like the disciples, we are prone to trusting in our senses and our human logic instead of saying to God, is there anything too hard for you, God? Whatever you want to do, Lord, you can do it. In reflecting on the moments of weak faith in the followers of Jesus, Charles Spurgeon writes, that is our way. When our faith is little, we begin calculating the pennyworths that are needed, and we make them out to be so much more than we possess or can possibly scrape together. That is not faith. It is reason, poor, dim, shallow reason, which forgets the infinite God and begins to calculate its own limited and insufficient resources. What are the difficult situations in your life today where you are relying on your own abilities and resources to figure it out? Perhaps a very broken relationship, a wayward son or daughter, a personal struggle with sin, Navigating through COVID, an uncertain future, having to face another day of demands as an exhausted mom. Are you tempted to despair because you've done the math? You've counted the resources and it just seems hopelessly inadequate? I have good news for you. You are unequal to the task. But Jesus is not. Might I encourage you, sisters and brothers today, lift your eyes from your own hands and place them on Jesus, who is able to meet all your needs, great and small, and who will always, always do what is best for you. We can trust him for this. Verse 10 Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. This is a beautiful scene for us to imagine. Jesus and his disciples and this vast crowd stretched across a grassy hillside, overlooking the Sea of Galilee with evening approaching. Mark tells us the, group sat down, or the people sat down in groups of 50s and 100s. You can imagine the anticipation of the crowd and the questions they were likely asking each other. Having young kids, I could imagine that some of the children there were asking, Dad, what is Jesus going to do? Why is he telling us to sit down? I don't know, son. Let's just watch and see. And you could imagine the thoughts of the disciples and their sideward glances towards each other as they directed traffic and arranged the people into groups. Here we go again. What's Jesus going to do this time? Notice that Jesus doesn't chastise his disciples for their unbelief. He simply puts his plan into action. He knows that the miracle he's about to perform will serve as the rebuke his disciples need. Let us also observe that although the disciples may have doubted Jesus' power and ability to do whatever he wanted in that moment, they're willing to obey his simple command to have the people sit down. I believe John Samus had it right when he penned the simple lyrics, Trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And this brings us to the climax of our event, the moment of great anticipation in verse 11. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. Notice that before performing this miracle, Jesus pauses to thank his Father. 
A good friend of mine and his family were over for dinner one time, and he must have, saw, uh, must have seen the look of unease on my face as our children began to eat before we had prayed. He leaned over to me and he whispered, It's okay. Nowhere in the Bible are we commanded to pray before eating. And he's right, actually. But I think we see here and in other passages that Jesus certainly set a pattern of giving thanks to his Father before eating. Consider when he instituted the Lord's Supper in Luke twenty two nineteen, We read, And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Of course, our prayers before our meals can become a matter of formality and tradition, detached from genuine feelings of thankfulness towards God, and we must always guard against this. But it is good and right that we pause before partaking in God's provision, since every morsel of food we have ever enjoyed and been physically sustained by has come to us by the kind and gracious hand of God. Just as the bread and fish were clearly a gift from God, the same can be said for the banana in your fruit bowl, which God grew from a seed in a plantation in Guatemala and providentially ensured that it passed through dozens of hands, crossed several borders on multiple vehicles before reaching your breakfast table. Fathers and mothers who are here today, don't be discouraged and don't be afraid to make your kids wait a few extra moments to eat while you thank God for the trucks and the grocers and the sunshine, all of which he used to bring the meal to your table. Prayer before meals is also a wonderful opportunity to give thanks for the gospel and the provision of God that he's made for sinners through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they wanted. Of all of Jesus' miracles, this might be the most understated one. These loaves that he just kept handing out, thousands of them, did not come from a seed which had turned into a plant that had to be harvested and milled and mixed with other ingredients and then baked. They just were. And the fish, thousands of them, they had never swam in the Sea of Galilee. Jesus just willed them to exist and they existed. John 1, 1 to 3, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. With unlimited power and resource, Jesus fed the people until they were satisfied, completely stuffed. They ate as much as they wanted, it says. In this miracle, we see the kindness of Jesus and his willingness to provide just what his people needed. And in this miracle, we see Jesus validating his claim to be God and the promised Messiah. If John were here today, and we could ask him, John, why did you record this miraculous sign? He might tell us, just keep reading my gospel, you'll get there. And eventually, after reading through several other miraculous signs, we would come to John 20, verse 30, which says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This miraculous supper that we've witnessed in the scriptures today has been recorded so that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, we may have life in his name. Every soul in the crowd on that hillside, and every soul in this room, and every soul that is watching from home has a much greater need than our next meal. 
We have a need for new life in Christ. God has made us to glorify him. But because of our sin nature inherited from Adam and our willful, sinful disobedience, all of us have fallen short of giving him that glory he deserves. We have pursued God's gifts instead of pursuing him. We have a sin debt to God that has brought us under his just condemnation. And to have his condemnation removed, that is our greatest need. As we heard from this very pulpit last week out of Exodus 34, God will not leave the guilty unpunished. Sin is so serious that the payment of sin is death and an eternity spent in hell. But we also heard last week that God, who is merciful and gracious, abounding in steadfast love and mercy, sent Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus, whom we've talked about so much today, lived the perfect life that you and I could not live, and he died on the cross in the place of sinners like us. Jesus died in the place of every sinner who repents of their sin and trusts in him alone to save them. No amount of Bible reading or church attendance or prayers before mealtime will earn us God's favor. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. This salvation from God's condemnation and the promise of an eternity spent with him is certain for all who repent and believe because Jesus is alive. After three days in the grave, he rose from the dead, proving that his sacrificial death on the cross was sufficient for the forgiveness of sin. This is the gospel. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. If God is drawing you to himself today, do not resist him. Go to him humbly with a repentant heart and plead for mercy, and mercy you will have. The Christian life is not the easy life. Talk to any saint who's been walking with the Lord for any amount of time, and they will tell you this. But it is the good life. It is hard, but it is happy. You will have to give up your life and deny yourself, but you will have God as your Father forever and a new life through Jesus. John 6, verse 12. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. Notice here that even though the provision was abundant and extravagant, Jesus does not promote wastage. Rather, he directs his disciples to gather up the leftovers so that nothing would be lost. And of course, Jesus knew that the result of this gathering would be 12 baskets of leftovers exactly one for each of the doubting disciples. I believe this would have served as the exclamation mark for them on Jesus' miracle. Do you think they got the message? I think they did, or at least they were starting to. Matthew 16, 15, Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. Verse 14. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. 
As our scene draws to a close, the crowd recognizes that Jesus is the prophet that Moses wrote about in Deuteronomy 18.15. However, their understanding of the kind of kingdom that Jesus had come to establish was very misguided. They wanted him as an earthly king then and there. Since he had the power to overthrow the Roman rule, heal their sicknesses, and feed them bread. But Jesus had come to, ex to establish a spiritual kingdom, which would not be advanced by any military or political means. It would be established by the laying down of his own life. And so we read that Jesus slips away from the feverish crowd into the mountain alone. And we finish kind of where we started, Jesus alone with his disciples. Well, I hope that we've been able to consider this familiar story once again with fresh eyes. We've been reminded that Jesus truly is the Son of God, equal with the Father in power and authority even to create and we've seen that our God is not a distant God who is indifferent to our needs, but he provides for every one of them in his timing for his purposes and for our good. And we've been admonished by the word to pursue Jesus as our all-satisfying portion and to trust in his ability to provide. Let us pray together. Lord God, we thank you for your word and for the work of your Holy Spirit. God, I trust that your word has done its intended purpose today and pray that it would continue to go into the hearts of the hearers this week and do its work. Keep us, Lord, pursuing you. Help us, Lord, to find in you our all-satisfying portion for the joy of our own souls, and for the glory of your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I believe we have one closing song.